Module 5 discusses impulse and momentum. Welcome to Engineering Physics. We have discussed in the previous module conservation of energy reiterates that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it is transformed. Take for example a light bulb, and as electrical energy is supplied, that same energy is then converted into heat and light, so nothing was destroyed. For conservation of linear momentum, supposing we have two objects where one or both are in motion. Upon reaching the other object, the motion is transferred. Let's take the example with billiard balls. As the player strikes the mother ball, it moves in a certain velocity until reaching the other ball at rest. The blue ball then moves from its initial state of rest, but the mother ball slows down. In another example, if we stack two balls together and release them at the same time, the balls will be together until reaching the ground. You would notice after that that the momentum of the basketball is then transferred to the tennis ball as the latter bounces higher than the basketball. Therefore, we can define momentum as mass in motion with the formula momentum is equal to mass multiplied by velocity or that is lowercase p is equal to m times v. The unit for mass is kilograms and velocity is taken as meters per second. So momentum is kilogram meter per second. Because velocity is a vector quantity, mass being scalar, momentum is considered as a vector quantity too. So it can be said that the x component of a momentum can be solved by multiplying its mass times its velocity in the x direction. And following the concept, momentum of y is equal to m times v of y and P of Z is the same as M times V of Z. With that formula, take note that momentum can increase. In the first image where a meteor is about to reach the Earth, at the moment that it enters the Earth's atmosphere where gravity is present, its momentum will increase due to the change of velocity caused by the gravitational acceleration. Similarly, a snowball which rolls down gains momentum as velocity is again affected by g or the gravitational pull. Let's check some examples of momentum. What is the momentum of a 10 kg object moving at 3 meters per second? With the formula p is equal to mv, we can just directly substitute all the given values to make the equation 10 kg times 3 meters per second, which is equal to 30 kg meter per second. Another example states, what is the total momentum of a 4 kg object moving at 2 meters per second and a 2 kg object moving at 3 meters per second in the same direction? With two objects moving at the same direction, we can compute for the total momentum by the summation of their individual momenta. So placing all the digits, we get 4 times 2 plus 2 times 3, which would be equal to 14 kg meter per second for our total momentum. The third momentum example is a 60 kg hockey player strikes the 150 gram puck 40 meters per second east. What is the velocity of the hockey player? In this example, the principle to be used is conservation of linear momentum, where initial and final momentum are equal. For the initial stage, there isn't any motion for both the player and the puck, so the initial momentum is zero. And this is equal to the final momentum, which would be mass of the player times his velocity plus mass of the puck times its velocity. And placing the term for the player in the other side, we get minus mass of the player times his velocity is equal to mass of the puck times its velocity. Then, plugging values we have negative 60 velocity of the player is equal to 0.15 times 40, which would give us the answer for the final velocity of the player equal to negative 0.1 meters per second. This would mean that he's moving to the west. Let's say that there is a speeding car which would need to halt at a certain intersection. The driver would have to exert a force to slow down the car at the right spot. He can do this in two different options. One is to apply a little force over a long period of time, or he can make a sudden stop by applying a large force over a short period of time. The correlation of force and change in time is what we call impulse, which is denoted as force times change in time or F times delta T, with the units Newton's second for SI. 
Here are some examples for impulse. A constant force of 200 newtons acts on a block at a constant rate for 10 seconds. Compute the impulse. Knowing that impulse is just force by change in time, we can directly solve for i with a given. That is, 200 newtons times 10 seconds, giving the answer 2000 newton seconds. When solving graphically, where time is the x-axis and the force is 4D ordinate, we can draw the constant force as such, and the area included is actually the impulse, so for this case, it would be computed as base times height, or that would be 10 times 200, which would give the same answer as 2000 newtons second. The other example goes, a variable force which increases from 0 newton to 200 newtons acts on a block at a constant rate for 10 seconds. Compute the impulse. With the variability of the force, impulse will be solved using average force. So we can plug the values 0 plus 200 all over 2 multiplied by 10 seconds, yielding the answer 1000 newton seconds. Graphically, with the same time force axis, the force will start at 0 and increase to 200 newtons. Take the area for the impulse, and the triangle shape will give us the area as 1 half base times height. So, if we place the digits, we would get 1 half of 10 times 200, giving the same answer 1000 newton seconds. The third example is a deviation of the second. A variable force which increases from 120 newtons to 200 newtons acts on a block at a constant rate for 10 seconds. Compute the impulse. With the same formula of impulse as I is equal to average force times delta T, place your figures to arrive at the answer. So, 120 plus 200 all over 2 times 10 seconds will give us 1600 newton seconds. Graphical computations will still proceed like the previous, but this time, the initial force is lifted to 120 newtons instead of zero, so the area becomes a trapezoid instead of a triangle. You can measure the area by dividing it into two regular shapes, like a rectangle and a triangle. So our formula becomes BH1 plus half of BH2 for the value of impulse. And placing the values, we get 120 times 10 plus half of 80 times 10 would be equal to the same 1600 newton seconds. How do we correlate our equations together? We start checking correlation between Newton's second law and momentum. We know well that Newton's second law is F is equal to M times A, where acceleration can be expanded as the change in velocity to that of the change in time. And, expanding further, change in velocity is simply the final less the initial velocity. So, if we place these expanded forms back to the equation, we can have MVF less MVI all over delta T, where, just as explained earlier, M times V is momentum making the numerator the change in momentum delta P. That is final momentum minus initial momentum, and everything is all over change in time, delta T. So, Newton's second law can be expressed in terms of momentum as delta P all over delta T. How about impulse momentum theorem? This is the correlation between impulse and momentum. The concept is that impulse is just the change in momentum or in formula, I is equal to delta P. And again, expanding both terms, we have the summation of F times delta T for impulse and delta P is just the final less the initial momentum. And momentum is mass times velocity, so delta P is just like final MV less the initial MV, or we can say Summation of force, delta T, is equal to M times the quantity, final, less initial velocity. Since there are cases with more than one object, collision might occur and the general formula will be the initial summation of mass and velocity is equal to the final summation of mass and velocity, which follows conservation of momentum. There are two types of collision. One is perfectly elastic collisions, where these can be described as objects which will remain separate even after colliding. 
An example would be billiard balls. In this kind of collision, both the kinetic energy and momentum are conserved, which means initial and final kinetic energy and momentum will be equal. The other kind of collision is perfectly inelastic collisions, which is described as the colliding objects are fused together to form a larger mass. Take an example of the space objects colliding where some get deformed and others fused. In this case, momentum is conserved making the summation of all individual momenta. However, kinetic energy is not conserved. This is because after collision, kinetic energy transforms into sound, heat, and internal energy, which is the cause of deformation. In reality, all objects are between these two types of collision. The last topic in this module is the coefficient of restitution, which describes the bounciness of objects. The formula for E is given as the ratio between the relative speed of two objects after collision to that before their collision. So in formula, we have V2 minus V1 is equal to U2 minus U1, where the object is considered not bouncy if E is equal to 0, and E is equal to 1 means the object is quite bouncy. Let's check an example for elastic collision. A 5 kg ball moving east at a speed of 6 meters per second strikes a 3 kg ball at rest. Calculate the velocities of the two balls assuming a perfectly elastic collision. With the general formula for collision, which is M1U1 plus M2U2 is equal to M1V1 plus M2V2, we can directly plug in our values which would give us an equation with two unknowns, that is 30 is equal to 5V1 plus 3V2. In order to find the required, we consider the other principle, where the kinetic energy is involved. It says that kinetic energy is also conserved, and in this process, we use its simplified formula, which is the initial and final velocity of object 1 is equal to the initial and final velocity of object 2. So placing the values, we get 6 plus V1 is equal to 0 plus V2. By using algebra with system of equations, we can substitute equations coming out with 30 is equal to 5v1 plus 3 times the quantity of 6 plus v1. And finally, v1 is 1.5 meters per second and v2 is 7.5 meters per second. Here is also an example of inelastic collision. A 5 kg ball moving east at a speed of 6 meters per second strikes a 3 kg ball at rest. The two blocks stick together. What is the speed of the two blocks? The conservation of momentum is used for inelastic collisions where the initial momentum is equal to the final. And expanding, we get M1U1 plus M2U2 is equal to M1V1 plus M2V2, where V1 is equal to V2 which we can write as final velocity Vf. Then we can replace the unknowns with the given, making the equation 5 times 6 plus 3 times 0 because the second ball is at rest. And these two are equal to 5 plus 3 multiplied by the final velocity. So just having one unknown, you can figure out the final velocity of the mass as 3.75 meters per second. The second inelastic collision example states that a 15 gram bullet is fired horizontally at a speed of 320 meters per second into a 2 kilogram block suspended by a string. The bullet remained embedded in the block. A. What is the final speed of the bullet and the block? B. How high will the bullet block system move? For letter A, we use the conservation of momentum stating that the initial momentum is equal to its final. And using its expanded form, we get 0 0.015 times 320 plus 2 times 0, which would be equal to 0 0.015 plus 2 multiplied by V sub F, which gives the answer for the final velocity as 2.38 meters per second. Then let's analyze requirement B. The object is considered as an inelastic condition when the bullet hit the block and because of the force, the suspended block will be rising to a certain height. At the moment of its maximum height, the bullet block system will already experience potential energy buildup 
and is getting ready to release it as kinetic energy when it will swing down, so conservation of energy will occur at that instant. If we expand the formula, we get mv squared is equal to mgh, where m of this system will cancel out, leaving us with h is equal to v squared all over g. And we can compute it as 2.38 squared all over 9.8, which would be equal to 0 0.58 meters. Suppose we have the last example. A 15-gram bullet is fired horizontally at a speed of 320 meters per second into a 2-kilogram block that rests on a horizontal surface. The bullet emerges from the block at a speed of 150 meters per second. What is the final speed of the block? The bullet will be hitting the resting block and it went through coming out with a slower velocity. In the same case, the resting block will move, so we are going to look for final velocity. We still work with the conservation of momentum given as initial momentum is equal to final momentum, so if we expand this equation, we get m1u1 plus m2u2 is equal to m1v1 plus m2v2. And then by plugging the given values, we get 0 0.015 times 320 plus 2 times 0 is equal to 0 0.015 times 150 plus 2 times v sub 2, our unknown. So finally, the answer for the final velocity of the block is given as 1.275 meters per second. Be prepared for the next module on rotational motion.